Hi everyone, welcome back again. I am delighted to welcome you to episode two with Simon and Tracy West from Word Forest. Um, I know episode one has been received very well across LinkedIn, Facebook and various different socials. So thank you for that. And I know if you, a number of you have clicked on wordforest.org and got involved and looked at the Kate Windsor video and a number of other things as well. So thank you for that. Also, don't forget to visit the shop, but we'll cover that in a little bit of a while. There's some great Christmas presents in there for those of you who are looking around for something environmental and nice to give to your friends and family. So welcome back again, Simon and Tracy. Thank you. It's lovely to be back with you. Phil. It is. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, We touched on it last episode and I know you landed it on me when we first met and I'd never heard the expression before. So for those people like me who've never heard the phrase permaculture, can you give us an overview of what permaculture means and why it's important for the for Word Forest and for other people of Kenya? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, the the term originated in Australia. A chap called Bill Mollinson, I think I've got his yeah. name right, um, came up with the idea that we really shouldn't be fighting nature. We should be working with it. And he put together a, a land management system that works with nature and gave it the name permaculture. That then spread around the world um, and took off greatly in the UK amongst uh, lots of gardeners who suddenly realised that everything that they'd been thinking about growing organically, about using um, uh, mulch and compost that they made themselves and not using strong pesticides and not using inorganic fertilizers, um, the things that are made from petrochemicals, they realized that those were all really good things and fitted with what we're trying to do to get the best possible out of our gardens. Um, of course, if you then start applying that to farming, then it can be very difficult if you've got massive great big fields that you know how do you cope with growing vast acres of crops but if you are a subsistence farmer in kenya those kind of growing methods of working with nature could be really useful so various kenyan people um, championed the idea and started to work out what works there because what works here might not just translate into, into being the same thing in Kenya. So they worked out their own methods. And we as an organization um, knew about permaculture. We've known about it for a long time as a, a thing that is, is a little bit of a hobby in the UK. You can do it as, a, as hobby gardening. And we realized that in Kenya, it could be a matter of life and death. Mm. That if you are growing one crop in your, farms, in your farm in Kenya, and it fails, then you're going to starve. You have a real problem. If you grow two, you stand a chance of both of them failing. If you grow 30 different things that are all growing together and you're feeding them all organically, you're feeding them all compost that you've made, the chances of everything dying are pretty slim. You're much more likely to have something that will survive, especially if you pick some drought resistant things to grow and some things that are quite happy if it gets very wet then you have something that you can either eat or sell to afford to buy something to eat. Absolutely. I was thinking, um, as you were saying, that I'm just looking out over our, the back of a, our office and our garden and looking at the tail end of our three sisters planting, which is a brilliant example of permaculture. So there's lots of companion planting. So if, for example, do, do you grow vegetables at all, Phil, in your garden? Have you got anything? Um, a little growing? bit. But I have to confess I'm not the gardener of the house. My wife is that's much a, more than That's I am. OK. But if you suffer with slugs and snails and things, it's easy to find a squirty spray to, to, to keep them away. But it's actually not impossible to find a natural liquid, which is frequently garlic and ginger and all mixed with water and then used as a spray and various other bits and pieces as well that they really don't like and if you spray that around your crops it's very likely to keep them away but you've got to have the knowledge you've got to know how to do these things but going back to the companion planting so the three sisters is a brilliant a brilliant example of great companion planting uh the origins of it it was uh first nation americans um and they used to grow hundreds of years ago, would grow a corn plant, which is nice and tall and strong. Um, yep. And up it, they would grow a, a bean of some description. Beans. And underneath, the beans. underneath, they would grow a plant with large leaves, a squash, something like a butternut squash or a Pumpkins. courgette or a pumpkin, yeah. something of that nature. And what they found was that all three grew better if you grew them 
like that. The bean grows up. Can you just be the bean plant? So that the maize, the maize grows nice and tall. The bean uses the maize for support, but in return, its roots fix nitrogen, which and is, of course, the natural fertilizer. One of the other really good things about Kenya is can you continue? <laughs> you, you can't get corn when you need it, can you? The great bit about the big the big leaves here for the for the for the squash is that this this area underneath the corn um between the ground and the, the those top leaves once it gets wet it remains wet and moist it keeps the liquid there so there's a, a much a, a, a lesser need if you like to keep watering it because you've got this lovely warm kind of you know high humidity level um area which is brilliant for bugs um and terrific for the plants and i have to tell you the three sisters we grew probably 40 um oh, maize plants, corn yeah. plants this year the the food on it was absolutely out of this world and i'm certain that's because the beans fixed that nitrogen into the soil and the flavor was just incredible so so that's a small example permaculture uh this land management system has 12 key principles that they work with um things like utilize the margins you know often you'll you'll do a bit of gardening and you won't take it right out to the edge you grow in a bit well don't you utilize your margins come out to your edges um there, there are lots of others and there are lots of other examples and it's a beautiful subject to explore but but another tiny example is is where would you put your compost so the compost bin is somewhere that you visit all the time or you should be doing your vegetable prep of an evening or lunchtime you want to just be able to go out just outside of your kitchen zone to put your compost in. If you stick your compost way down at the end of your garden, you're less likely to use it because you've got to get all the way down the end. So therefore it's a logical system that says, bring that right up to the area where you're doing your food prep. And it's a logical system. It, it as you say, works with mother nature and, and it, it helps you to overcome some of the challenges that you face, which are different in Australia um to they are in the uk but 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 the essence of them is the same and permaculture has been a game changer because people are growing things that that as you said um simon they don't necessarily want to eat spice gardens are a typical example so a kenyan palate is uh, quite a bland palate they don't really like they don't like spicy things um However, ginger grows brilliantly, garlic grows brilliantly, spices grow brilliantly, and at the coast, there's a uh, it's it's Italian and Arab really, particularly, isn't it? In food food wise, and of course they love all their spices. They love all the garlic and the ginger and so on. So that's a perfect thing to grow. No one's going to eat it, but they can take it to market and sell it. Um, so you know you've got that income generation thing going on, and also things like garlic are brilliant for preventing other bugs and slugs don't like garlic so if you put garlic all the way around your veg patch they're very unlikely to penetrate and go into the more tender crops that they'd be likely to munch um so have a nice barrier around the edge of garlic and you are good to go <laughs> i didn't know that about garlic i love eating it but i didn't know about Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um so is that what you mean? Because like there's a lot of biodiversity built into your word first program in Kenya. And is that what you mean? Is this this yeah. multi-crop system, permaculture, um, and then the utilization of obviously the, the trees bring back, you know, the 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 potentially uh, saw in your video they were talking about at one point there was, you know, beasts and whatnot that would be um all around those sort of Kenyan areas that, that were in the film. They're saying bring the trees back and we think the animals will return. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, they have in some of the uh, the original areas where we were planting, um, creatures were coming back to the area that had never been there, not not in a generation. Um, so the dick dick is a brilliant example of that. The dick dick is the smallest of the antelope family. It's a beautiful little creature, so endearing. And it has this little snuffly nose because it sort of snuffles. Oh, it's just beautiful. Look up the dick dick. It's gorgeous. And that's back in the areas that we're planting in. Um, and it hadn't been before uh, for, for many years. Um, the Clark's weaver bird is an endangered species and we're planting in the Dakacha woodland areas. And that's one of the only places in the world where the Clark's weaver bird is found. So we're extending that 
area and they're happy as Larry, whoever yeah. Larry is. Um, but, you know, biodiversity is critical. We need that mix of this and that. And it's the same with the trees. We don't sort of plant one type of tree. We've got to plant a selection of trees. If Mother Nature is going to, you know, give us all of her creatures to do all of the pollination that she needs to do, we need a broad range of, of, of trees that are there to, to encourage them. Do you know, bringing it back to British trees, just as an example, we've got two trees, we've got very many trees in our garden, but we've got two trees that are quite different. Um, there's a sycamore tree mm -hmm. and there's an oak tree. The oak tree is actually 150 years old. It's, it's quite oh. awesome. But... The difference between those two trees is vast in terms of biodiversity. So on the sycamore tree, I think you have something like about, or well, actually it was um, our um, horticultural trustee that came around and told you how many invertebrates it had on it, insects and invertebrates. And it was about 70, so it hasn't got very many. It's only about 70. And I thought, 70? Blimey, that's loads. And he said, your oak trees over there, 300. 300 different types of creepy crawly, all of which feed the birds, feed the butterflies, feed the bats, et cetera, the owls, the, the list goes on. So if you had, but I'm sure that the sycamore, bless it, it's got some endearing features. It might have some on there that the oak tree doesn't cope with. So by mixing it up, you, you get that wonderful balance, that mixture of all things. Um, and uh, it, Mother Nature wins, you know, you get that lovely thing. The other thing that we haven't mentioned is very related is syntropic agroforestry. So uh, by combining planting of trees, if you imagine a horseshoe shaped area of tree planting going on and in the middle of that horseshoe, say perhaps a cash crop of, um, of tomatoes and maize or something else going on, the syntropic agroforestry bit is the trees are providing this 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 respite, this little pocket of rest from the harsh winds or the harsh sun. It might be giving them a bit of shade or, you know, giving them a, a bit of protection so that they grow better. And of course, because the tree roots are locking water into that particular area, everything grows better anyway, because there's more there's more water available for the plants to grow. So you've got syntropic agroforestry, which is another sort of handhold on, isn't it, really, from permaculture. And those ideas and those concepts are they, they just work great. They work terrifically well in Kenya. And as I say, what we're doing is unlocking that education which exists there and spreading the word as best as we can. And the bonus at the end of the day is we we'll plant some trees for you. That's you can do that. That's easy. <laughs> it works out well for us all. The, there's the excellent sort of theory of the wood wide web as well. That sort of trees are <laughs> yeah. with Absolutely. the use of fungal culture and they can actually you know help each other. If one's sick is one tree is sick, the other ones will probably could rally around. There's lots of evidence they, to they do. That. So um that's excellent. Uh, speaking of rain, because one of the things you, you touched on when we spoke um, before we started recording is the different types of rains in Kenya and, and how your program is aiming to stabilize them. I'm not saying it's fixing it because that's wrong terminology, but aiming to stabilize where possible. So just describe or, or walk us through that a little bit, please. Yeah, so it's it's the two different seasons. You get the short rains, which are at the, the back end of the year for us. Because right? they don't really get seasons the same way we do because they're right by the equator. So you get the short rains and the long rains, which should come around about April time. Um, and they, when we first started planting there, they'd had six or seven years of effective right. drought where the short rains didn't come at all and the long rains were way too short and not enough came then they got flood mm. um by planting trees tracy was talking earlier about evapotranspiration the trees actually cause microclimate changes so you get a, a climate in an area where there's just grassland that is very windy and very dry if you have trees then the winds slow down which reduces the evaporation which it allows the microclimate to be moister. Um, if you think of your typical view from being a, a UK citizen of a jungle, you think dark green, hot and wet. You don't think of anything being dry. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to encourage by planting lots of trees. If you plant, plant a couple, it's not going to make much difference. But if you plant just over a million trees, which is where we are with numbers in the seven years we've been going, then that does begin to make a difference. 
if we get to what the Kenyan government have just announced they want, mm. I'll I keep going on to that. I think a question about that, but I they have just announced that they want by 2032 to plant 15 billion trees. And that's right. an awfully large number of trees if you just take it as that big number. So being a, a, a numbers person, I wanted to break it down. What does that actually mean? Well, we generally plant up to a thousand trees per acre. And if you work out the total area of Kenya, then 15 billion trees would give them an extra 10% tree cover which would be fantastic which on top of their seven percent that they've got today will bring them up to about 17 percent or more than we have mm. which is great so if they achieve that then that's really good that takes them to 17 percent but then i got to thinking well what does that mean for an individual and if you divide the 15 billion by the number of people there are in kenya then it's about 283 trees each that's for every man woman and child and then I thought about that over the nine years between now and 2032, and it works out that they've got to plant roughly one a week, which is achievable. Yeah. This is the point that we can do that, and that will make such a difference. I think one of the most exciting things, if a little bit challenging in its timing, um, was that Kenya, in their ma massive declaration of uh, wanting this mission to be uh, fulfilled said last Thursday uh, that they would say uh, they said right we, we're going to have a national tree planting day well that was going to be in so Thursday Friday Saturday Saturday four days time so uh, it was literally four days from the announcement of we're going to do this thing to when it was actually taking place so there was a lot of shuffling and moving around to get uh, I think we got a couple of thousand in the ground a couple of thousand team. trees planted which was amazing but about 300 people taking part if we'd had a bit more time then that would have been <laughs> lovely but the point is they put a stick in the sand yeah. i have said for a very long time the uk should have a tree minister not an environment minister coming under the cap of defra a tree minister somebody responsible for the trees in the uk it's such a vital commodity um and we really should be focused on the mature stock particularly that we've got in this country we certainly can't afford to lose it um, and there should be somebody just in charge of that one single thing and I think Kenya have done a brilliant job of saying we're going to have a tree planting day and they actually made it a national holiday so this is terrific absolutely terrific uh, and, and I would love to see it echoing around the world. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a new minister appointed as a tree minister? And the good news is we've got a year's notice for the next one, yes. which will be next November. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that's awesome. And it, it's like, as you say, a tree minister over here. I mean, I've seen my local woods, I'd, you know, we'll go walking across the fields and obviously ash dieback has had a terrible effect in, in some of the woodland here uh, near where I live. Um, so without bringing the mood down, I think it's important we cover some of the 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 darker side of this. Um, not your program, but just environmentally generally. Um, I know the you know we spoke before um for recording that the IMO have released some statistics which are fairly shocking today. So I don't know if you the, want to. WMO, sorry, it was WMO, the World. Sorry. No, it's fine. The World Meteorological Organization. Yes. Um. So they've put out a report today that has declared that. Well, I'd like to find the words and I don't wish to quote it out of turn, but essentially, uh, oh, if I may. Yes, please do. Glasses on. Uh, the World Meteorological Organization have said there is no end in sight to the rising trend, uh, which is largely driven by the burning of fossil fuels. And the concentration of carbon dioxide, the main greenhouse gas, is now 50% higher than it was before the start of the industrial revolution. So the abundance of climate heating gases in the atmosphere reached record highs in 2022, and they're continuing to go on. Now we've had record breaking year upon record breaking year. And there, there is, in their, in their opinion, no end in sight. That's being in full knowledge of what all of the governments of the world are doing, no one's government is doing enough. No one, certainly ours isn't. Um, and they need to be. They absolutely need to be. There are enough scientists out there um, giving us 
the information. They're telling us what we need to do. And it's, I feel, I have done for a long time, it's up to organisations like Word Forest. Uh, it's up to grass, pardon the pun, but grassroots organisations and groups, tree planting groups in communities, eco groups here, there and everywhere, the WI, you name it, all of the guides, the the and, scouts and ultimately down to individuals it is to make this change we do we need to do it and we need to drive further change yeah. up the chain into local government and ideally up to national government but while we're waiting we haven't got time to wait yes. so we need to take it on board and we need to just get these things done which is i mean we've been the facilitators of groups planting trees here in the UK. We have planted a few thousand here in the UK, not anywhere near as many as obviously as Kenya, but we do that really as sort of a, a it's a talking point, isn't it? It's yeah. to, to create conversations and to get people starting to talk about trees. But as, as we've already explained, the, the key place we need to plant them to exacerbate, uh, to, to sorry, to, to cut down the problems we're facing with the climate emergency is the is is Kenya. The UK yeah. is important, of course it is, but there that's the place that it's critical. It is, we plant. It's always much more difficult to find land on which you can plant trees. That's in a challenge. Yeah. In Kenya, they have lots of land on which they want to plant trees. Yeah. That makes a big difference. So let's round it up to in terms of people who run organizations. Let's start with them. So I want to talk about what people who and organizations can do, and then what individuals watching this who want to do and can do. So we'll start with organizations. So let's say that like this, I don't know, this is going across LinkedIn. There'll be a number of people who are in leadership roles in firms, large and small. How do they, they, they get inspired from this, hopefully, and want to check you out and make a change and say, we're going to be part of this. We're going to make a change. We're going to contribute. How do they do, how do they go about doing that? May I? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's like we were both ready. We we're poised. Uh, make us your charity of the year. Um, come on board as a corporate partner. We have a terrific range of corporate partners who help us in a variety of ways, not just the obvious one financially. Obviously, if we become uh, corporate partners with someone, we want them to be unlocking funds to come our way. And many of them do. They do it via just simple donations, um, set donations that they do each month. Others do it according to a product that they're selling they might sell a product and give us a small amount of the um the revenue that they've got from that product that's another great way but other ways are by giving us pro bono assistance so management consulting assistance we get from one which is absolutely terrific um we get a range of things uh that can be really helpful so for a commodity for a firm that has lots of a, a particular thing that we might need I don't want to grab something out of the air but it may well be that that, that that exchange by giving a product to us it can help us enormously um I'm thinking about menstrual cups there was a uh, I was able to get hold of several menstrual cups when we went over to Kenya last uh and we did that we got them for a for a very 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 low cost and we passed them over to our, our, our uh, the mothers of the forest in Kenya that was terrific um to have had them free free of charge would have been even better still but uh i mean we barely paid for the carriage so it was just fantastic there are lots of ways they can help us make us a charity of the year and we in return will help them to strengthen their sustainable pillars in their own firm because there's stuff that we know that we can impart and and help them on their way um, there's lots of information um, out there, but it's really nice when you can just pick a phone up and say, I'm thinking of doing this. For example, we had a supper last week with uh, one of our corporate partners who brought together uh, a large bunch of their key partners, uh, key clients rather, sorry, uh, and they served a vegan supper. Now, plant-based food is one of the lightest ways to eat, uh, obviously, on the planet. And it was so inspirational to be part of that supper. There were so many, so many messages going out there saying plant-based food is number one, absolutely amazing, incredibly creative, cheaper, sustainable. Oh, hang on a minute. It's really good for the planet. Why don't more firms do it? Well, if someone rings us up and says, well, we're doing a thing. Can you give us some guidance? We're eight years uh, vegan, Simon and I, for the planet. Uh, and we can definitely point them in the right direction. So um some little helpful tips like that we can help them if they help us so that's one way so 
and you asked about individuals. Yes. Individuals, obviously, they can do a donation. Go on to wordforest.org slash donate or click the donate button on the top and make a donation. Um, regular donations are very much appreciated. All charities say this yeah. because it gives us a way to, to plan a little bit if we know that we've got, you know, these donations are coming in every month. Um, but the other way and is... Aid. And give aid. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. No, don't mention and it. If you are a taxpayer, please, please, please tick the gift aid box because that increases the value of your donation by 25%. So if you give us a pound, we get £1.25 in actual receipt if you tick the gift aid thing. So that's really good. Um, at this time of year, we're thinking about Christmas and we're thinking about buying things for people. Well, we do have a shop um, where we sell ethical, organic T-shirts, hoodies, tote bags. In fact, I'm wearing one of the T-shirts. I will just stand up just to show you. This is one of our celebrities. Celebrity T-shirts designed by... Designed by Mr. Ben. Well, what? designed by the creator the of Mr. The, ben. The co-creator of Mr. Yeah. Ben, absolutely. So, I think I think just, just for clarity for those younger viewers, um, you have to be our sort of age group parents. Ask your parents, ask yeah. Ask your parents who Mr. Ben was, and they'll go all misty-eyed. Yeah, they will. Uh, and they'll probably be making a, a, a dash and a, and, a, and a, you know, they'll be heading to the shop to buy it. It's but younger great. people, buy your dad your Mr. Parents. Ben t-shirt. You can't go wrong. Absolutely. But yeah. Kate, Kate Winslet also designed one for We have an exclusive design by Kate Winslet and a few other celebrities as well. Mm -hmm. Um but we also have um, yeah. some some really nice designer designed ones. Yes, we got we uh, gifted with some designs from um, people who design for big shops, um, which was really nice. And they also have done uh, a set of mugs. So we've got new this year is the launch of a set of mugs. So if you want that that Christmas present for somebody who's really difficult to buy for, go and buy them a mug. I think the key thing is, is if you're going to buy anything for anybody, uh, that means you love them. If you love them, buy the planet a gift as well. That's yeah. it, bottom line. Every single item that we sell has a very simple profit margin built into it. It's not difficult to do the maths. Um, it's £2.50. Uh, so th if there's £2.50, there's a slice of two fifty in there, that will, or, or in some oh. cases, a, a little bit more, um, uh, I think, but no more than two, no more than five pounds on, on a couple of things. That'll put two trees in the ground. If it's got 250 profit margin, it'll get one tree in the ground. So everything you buy will result in a tree going in the ground, alleviating hunger, alleviating, alleviating poverty and alleviating our climate crisis. Well, that's if that's not a great thing to give to someone that you love, I don't know what is. Um, so, yeah, look on the shop and, and, and please support us. Uh, we've also got a really splendid shop. It's a it's an e-cards shop. And it was designed by the super geek of the house, Mr. West, who is just such a whiz with creating all sorts of brilliant things. Um, it's a, it, it, yeah, it's an e-card shop address. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, if you go on to wordforest.org, yeah, you, can find you, it can, on there. you can find it on there. Um, and the point being, they are electronic page turning cards. Really and swish. And if you buy one, it's a pound. If you buy five, I forgot what the pricing is now, but you get them, you get them for 50p each if yeah, you buy five. That's right. That's and if right. you buy up to 20, you get them even cheaper than that. And you can schedule the times that you want to send them. So you could sit down in the middle of November, write all your Christmas cards, and then just have them go out on the morning of whenever you want them to go out on December the 1st or whenever you want it to be. You could do all of your birthdays all the way through the year. Just sit down with a nice cup of tea and say, right, I'm never going to get someone moaning at me saying you never sent me a card on my birthday. That You can just get them all done uh, uh, on one day. And then just, as Simon said, just schedule them in. Just They'll make sure you get their email addresses correct yeah. because... I can't make them up. I can't no. guess what somebody's email address is. But, but they're so lovely. And we really yeah. did enjoy making that that shop. So the e-cards are also a really smashing way of helping us to get those critical trees in the ground and not using paper. Well, the great thing is it's coming up to that season as well, where there will be people sending out or thinking of sending corporate cards. So yes. it could be your, you know, I don't know, for us contractors or clients or whatever. So instead, maybe go on the e-shop and send everyone a, an e-card from, from Wordforest. We can also do, if it is a large enough amount for a corporate client, we have also in the past, Simon has created a bespoke card 
that has the logo and you know the message and the president's signature or whatever they want on there and that can be sent out en masse we can create those as well so don't think it just has to be a standard card there's oh gosh it must be over six or seven hundred designs on there to choose from but if you want something really specific we can do it you can pay for it and it'll get all those trees in the ground which would be just such a bonus for the planet as well great stuff well look it's been an absolute pleasure meeting <laughs> and chatting with you guys um just word again wordforest.org for anyone who wants to look it up but links will be at the bottom of this um i'm going to go across all socials Thank we'll you. connect both of you of course as well when we, we we schedule and post these so people can loop back with you and ask you any questions and reach out and start getting involved but for now, thank you so much. And I look forward to speaking and watching Word Forest grow even further and further. Bless you. Thank you, thank you so much. And I can I just say one last thing? Sure. We started off by talking about the WMO report, which is sobering, uh, challenging, chilling. And there is a lot of dark news out there. If you decide to turn towards Word Forest, if you decide to, to, to come along and support us, you can create such good in the world and we can start to make those bad news stories be really good news stories instead. We all need more good news in the world. So by supporting us, you're changing the narrative and you're creating optimism for all of our futures and for our children and our grandchildren's futures. So it can be done. I want to just stress that change can happen if it's done en masse. Everything counts in large amounts. So start thinking about the positive that can be found. And it's definitely here in Word Forest. Thank you, Phil. No problem at all. It's been a pleasure. Let's speak again soon. Bye. Just bye.